Welcome to the podcast Crime Salad. We are husband and wife and partners in crime. My name is Ashley. And I'm Ricky. So glad that you could join us for this episode. We are about to dive into the darkest corners of human nature. So brace yourself as this specific episode involves extremely graphic details and includes details of sexual violence, torturous behavior, and animal abuse. So please use caution. The eccentric next-door neighbor who keeps to himself appears to be an ordinary guy who volunteers his time as a neighborhood watcher, knowing that your safety is in good hands. But you soon discover that this guy you always thought was just a bit strange turned out to be a serial killer with intentions that would lie in the darkest of desires. What entices someone to seek out the darkest evil in the most heinous ways. This is the story of the serial killer, whom some people refer to as the Butcher of Kansas City, an evil individual who would target the weak, bring them into his house, and do what he wanted with them. Victims went to hell at the hands of Robert Burdella. Tragically, those who lost their lives in this story that we are covering today are Jerry Howell, age 20, Larry Pearson, age 20, Robert Sheldon, age 18, Mark Wallace, age 20, James Ferris, age 20, and Todd Stoops, age 21. So it seems like all of them were pretty much the same age. Yeah, in their early 20s. Right. And it's believed that there could be more. But these are the victims who were tricked into walking into a house of horrors. We have to give you an additional warning because, like we said, this episode contains very graphic details that includes animal abuse, which involves a dog that is really hard to even talk about or read about, and also mentions of rape. Ricky, are you ready to take the old crime salad time machine back to the late 80s to Kansas City? Let's do it. Kansas City, the home of the Kansas City Chiefs. Taylor's boyfriend's team, as some would refer to it. And specifically in Kansas City is an area called Hyde Park, currently known as the largest neighborhood in the city. There are many historic homes here. In Kansas City, there was a strange bird named Robert Burdella. Now, Ricky, have you ever driven through a neighborhood or like a town And maybe there was like a house that kind of striked you in some weird way. Like you just had this feeling that something eerie happened in that house. Or maybe you see somebody and you're like, that guy definitely killed somebody. Kind of. Not as much as you do, but I get what you're saying. (laughs) Maybe it's just my crime salad brain. Yeah. But (laughs) most of the time when I see a house, I wonder, I wonder how much this house is selling for. I feel like that explains our personalities like perfect. Yeah. Yeah. Now, to tell you the truth, Robert Burdella, he came off as a normal person. He actually looks quite normal. Like if you saw his picture, you would think, I don't know, maybe he was a professor or something. And he owned a house on Charlotte Street that sat close to two other houses. And along this area were houses just lined along the road. No one really had like a large yard or anything. Now, one thing that was a little strange about Robert that everyone who knew him knew about was he owned this little shop called Bob's Bazaar Bazaar. So I'm looking at the name, and he spelled it B-I-Z-A-A-R, and then spelled Bazaar. Bob's Bazaar Bazaar. Yep. It's pretty creative. And he actually made shirts that had this logo on it, and underneath it, it said, everyone needs a place to get folked up. Folked up? Yeah. What does that mean? Like F-O-L-K-E-D. Folked? Like folk music? Maybe. Okay. Strange it was the guy. 60s, right? Oh, right. This is the 60s. 50s, 60s. He was probably on acid. And he operated the store at a local flea market. 
Some would be totally creeped out by the things that he would sell in his little booth, while others might find it fascinating. He displayed shrunken heads. Some sources say that there were human skulls, while other sources say that they were just models. But honestly, I wouldn't be surprised if they were actually human skulls because of the story that we're about to tell. And there were animal skulls and occult books and different various antiques. Sounds like a cool store, other than the fact that it was run by a serial killer. But if it wasn't... Yeah, next time I see a little store like this, I'm going to be like, hmm... Also, not to get too off topic here, but wasn't there something in the news recently where they found like a human skull at Goodwill? Oh, yeah. They found a human skull in one of the donation bins at a Goodwill. Like it was on display like for someone to buy already or was it like being sorted? They were being sorted. So someone dropped off like this box of random taxidermy things Mm -hmm. and then also this skull that appeared to be real, like there's little bone fragments inside and missing teeth. And a medical examiner's office said that it was, in fact, a human skull, which is crazy. Confirmed. But they said that it appears to be historic and ancient. So it doesn't appear to have any forensic value. And they mentioned that there's no crime attached to the skull at all. So no one's looking for this skull. No one's looking for it. Interesting. I'm assuming somebody used it as like a decoration in their little taxidermy place or something. Maybe they bought it from Robert. Oh my, what if it is? This should be investigated. Where did this happen? Oh, it looks like it happened in Arizona, so that's unlikely. Yeah, but you never know. Still could be. Now, although Robert had this really creepy store, he kept his dark desires hidden from the public view pretty well, even being the head guy to start a neighborhood watch program. In a neighborhood watch program, they're all about working with other neighbors to keep their neighborhood safe and reduce crime. Narc. But it's a pretty good shield if you're, you know, a serial killer. Hidden in plain sight. The chicken guy in uh, Breaking Bad. Yeah, exactly. So needless to say, Robert was a well-respected man. He was even a father figure to younger men, mostly in their 20s, who were struggling in living on the streets. Most of the time, these young men were living in motels or cars, actively living off the money that they would make from sex work. Robert presented himself as the kind man that could make a difference in their lives and get them onto the right path. But everything changed when a naked man named Chris Bryson jumped out of his two-story window from his house wearing only a dog collar. Okay, that's got to turn some heads. Like, that's got to gain some attention. It definitely did. So, Robert Brudella, born in 1949. He was the oldest child in the family, and he had a younger brother named Daniel. The family lived in Cuyahoga Falls, Ohio, which is pretty close to Akron, Ohio. It's pretty close to us. Why does all this crazy stuff happen near us? Ohio is a weird state. It is. Now, from a young age, Robert was diagnosed with high blood pressure. And he also was nearsighted. And he had to wear those very thick type glasses at age five. And he also had a severe speech impediment. Not that these things are bad, but it made it difficult for him to fit in with his peers. He did very well in school. He was mostly interested in art-related things. Sports just weren't his thing, which was a huge disappointment to his father. Because he wasn't interested in being the family athlete, this caused a disconnect between him and his father. However, the youngest boy, Daniel, was the golden child. He was into sports. So his father focused more on him and favored him more. And later, Robert would explain that this was the wedge that separated him from having a close relationship with his father and really his entire family. And there was another thing. You see, this was years ago in the 50s and 60s when the traditional way of living was the norm. And around this time, he reached puberty when he realized that he was gay. And as you can imagine, in the 50s and 60s, this would be frowned upon. So basically, this would be another disappointment to the family who tried to raise their children with traditional beliefs being Catholic. 
On top of feeling like he was shunned by the family, he was also very isolated from having any friends. So he lived a very lonely childhood. And not to support Robert because he did some really messed up stuff later on, but looking at his childhood alone, any kid who is rejected by everyone in their life, family, friends, from school and teachers for years, how would that not mess you up? It would definitely make you feel like the, the black sheep, like horrible, horrible feeling. Yeah, like you're an ultimate failure. Right. Which would be hard for any kid growing up. Mm -hmm. And as he grew older, it badly affected him. He started to build this tough outer shell, repelling all the constant rejection over the years. In his teens, he became more aggressive and rude and took it out on mainly women. And his rudeness became part of who he was. So this brings to mind another serial killer. This kind of reminds me of Jeffrey Dahmer because I, I believe he felt a lot of rejection, but specifically from his parents. Yeah, strangely, there are a lot of similarities between these two serial killers. I mean, other than the whole cannibal thing, right? Right. Now, Robert, he spent his personal time doing little hobbies like coin collecting and stamp collecting. And like we said, he had an interest in art-related things. He was interested in writing, and he had different pen pals from all over the world even had pen pals in Vietnam and Burma. They would exchange interesting things like photographs of historical things. And that's how he got into the worldly oddities. Now, there were a few big adjustments that happened around the time when Robert was 17. On December 25th, 1965, Christmas Day, Robert's father died of a sudden heart attack as they were visiting family. Although Robert didn't have this close relationship with his father, it was still hard to live with the fact that his father died. The father died at the age of 39, so this was very unexpected. Wow, that's young. And Robert, he took this very hard. But what upset him even more was that his mom remarried very soon after his death. Robert didn't take that very well. He saw this as betrayal towards his father, so he basically lost respect for his mother and other women, he became dismissive and would intentionally talk down on other women like they were worthless. And this is around the same time when he started to collect antiques and various artifacts. Perhaps he was inspired by his pen pals that he wrote, or maybe he was inspired by this film called The Collector that was currently playing in theaters at the time. This film showing at the theaters in 1965 is about a woman who was captured by this guy who was pretty much withdrawn from society. And he has this obsession to capture and collect butterflies, which could be symbolizing the soon fascination of capturing a woman. Before she was abducted by this man, he stalked her and put chloroform up to her face with a rag. Oh my God, I know this movie. You've seen it? I did. My mom used to clean houses when I was a kid, and I've always thought about this movie. They had this, like, big screen TV, but it was in the 90s, so it was like a giant block, and it was played on, like, a record, almost. Really? Like, it looked like a record that you had to put on a thing, and, like, that was the movie. That's so weird. That's so weird. Yeah. Like, this movie seems really interesting, but at the same time, it's even more interesting because I feel like it really, really peaked Robert's interest. Now, he put the chloroform up to her face to make her lose consciousness. Wait, your mom let you watch this? She didn't know. Oh. <laughs> How old were you? My mom used to bring me to work because we couldn't afford daycare. <laughs> like five or? Yeah, probably. Well, anyway, he did this while she was leaving the local pub. And when she woke up, she was in this basement without any windows. How many times did you watch this? Just once. In parts of the movie, he ties her up so she can't leave. And he keeps her hidden if someone came over. And sometimes he would allow her to leave the basement to go upstairs to get some sunlight and maybe let her take a bath, only if it was under his supervision. 
And this woman tries to escape on a number of occasions. But one that I found interesting is this woman, she grabs a shovel and hits him over the head with it. And although he's injured, he drags her into the basement, locking the door. And at this point, she's wet from being out in the rain. And somehow she breaks an electric heater that was down there to keep her warm. So she's left in this cold, dark basement. And the guy, he leaves for three days to go seek medical attention to his wound. And then she dies. I remember this part. Yeah, she dies of pneumonia. Yeah. And so he buries her in the backyard and moves on to another woman. Dang, the collector. That's it, the collector. Where all my trauma comes from. <laughs> Were you influenced by this movie, Ricky? Maybe, actually. I'm, I don't know. I remember it being, like, I remember there was, like, a field of butterflies and all this stuff, and I remember being, like, mesmerized by it. We should watch this. It, like, blew my mind. That is crazy. And then we ate, like, ramen noodles or for lunch or something. <laughs> and my mom told me, don't touch the safe in the basement. You're like, I want to now. <laughs> Anyways, back to Robert. Around this time, he was doing very well in school, and he was getting great grades, and he graduated from high school. And he decided to move out of Ohio to Kansas City, Missouri. And there, he enrolled in the Kansas City Art Institute with the goal of becoming a college professor one day. Now, being at an art school was pretty life-changing for him. This gave him a chance to get away from his family's lifestyle And here he began to find himself. He got more comfortable in his own skin. He was more accepted. And he started to make some friends. The students that he became friends with got him into drugs, which, I mean, at an art school in the 60s. Definitely a lot of acid at an art school in the 60s. I didn't live in the 60s, but I heard some stories. But we also both went to art school, so we know what it's like. (laughs) I never did LSD. Me either, but... I saw the pictures. Other people did it. (laughs) And this seemed to lead him to selling drugs and doing drugs and drinking alcohol excessively. He would be arrested at the age of 19 when he was caught selling meth to an undercover cop. But he was released after posting a bond of $3,000. Shortly after this, like a month later, he was arrested again for selling weed and LSD. But these charges were dropped. Because like we said, this is the 60s at an art school. I mean, what are they going to do? Arrest everybody there? This is Woodstock era. Now, art can be a little weird. Sometimes I don't even understand it. How does it make you feel? But Robert, now that he's more comfortable in his own skin, maybe he got a little too comfortable. Because this is when he started to do some really weird artistic things, I guess you could say. We already gave you a warning, but... We have to give you an additional warning because, like we said, this episode contains very graphic details that includes animal abuse. For, like, these school projects, he would bring in a number of animals and would torture them. On one occasion, he brought in a duck, tortured it, and decapitated it. And he did the same to a chicken. Then he showed how to prepare it for a meal. And this was kind of like the start of his disturbing interest that we know of. But like somehow he got away with this. And because he got away with this, he took it up a notch. He then brought in a dog. I won't go into details, but he did pretty much the same thing, adding tranquilizers and sedatives and things like that. To do what? He really explained that this was art. I mean, he couldn't take up painting? Okay, it sounds like he got away with the chicken and the duck, but there is no way they would have let him do this to a dog. Like, someone had to have stopped him. You think that they would just, this is it, like, what are you doing, like, in the middle of it? But he pretty much did everything that he did to the duck. To the dog? Yeah. Oh, that's awful. After this was said and done, Robert, he was not liking the criticism that he started to get from the school. They kind of confronted him. Hey, you can't do this anymore. This is a little bit, you know, disturbing. This is cruel. So he withdrew himself. So no more school. It didn't work out. And he focused his time on working at fancy restaurants, working his way up to a senior chef level at several fancy restaurants and helping establish a training program for young chefs. What did he put on his resume? I mean, I recently... Um, Duck preparer. Duck preparer. 
And like we mentioned, he had this hobby of collecting antiques and strange little things. So that's when he established his little flea market booth called Bob's Bazaar Bazaar. So it was around this time that he started that shop. This was the new Robert in the 60s and going into the 70s. But around this time, he also started to give people in need a place to stay because he was a really good guy. He, you know, wanted to help the community. He wanted to help these young men who were living in the streets as sex workers who had no place to live, and he wanted to put them on the right path. Yeah, I don't buy that. Well, a lot of people did. And, you know, I think he kind of got away with this because he positioned himself as a really good person. You know, he would explain to these young men in the streets that it's extremely dangerous out here. You could just be picked up by anybody and get killed. Yeah. This is dangerous for you. You shouldn't be doing this. Get in my car and come home with me. So he would give these young men a place to stay. Seemingly really caring guy, but he would get irritated with them if they wouldn't do better for themselves, which would make sense if you are trying to help someone, but he did it in a way that would bring them down. Like, you're nothing without me. You couldn't live without me. Wow. Really, like, degrading. So did he actually help anybody? He actually did at first. He made some good friends where, like, they would come over, show up at his doorstep, and Mm. be like, hey, can I have a place to stay? At the beginning, nothing bad was really happening that we know of. Right, right. So it turned into something. Yeah. Everyone knew Robert as this guy. Neighbors would describe him as a father figure to these young men. He was the neighborhood watcher. He was, you know, helping all these people. He was just like a really, really good guy all around. He really built this facade. For now. Now, by 1984, he's still running his store at the flea market, and eventually he starts to become friends with one of the other merchants that are close by named Paul Howell. And somehow Robert starts to get to know his son, Jerry Howell. And it's said that Jerry and his friends would poke fun at Robert for being gay and helping male prostitutes by giving them a place to stay. Now, Jerry, he was a sex worker, and he kind of saw through what... Robert was trying to do. But Robert stuck with what others saw him as, this father figure. And he showed initiative by taking Jerry under his wing to help him off the streets and get him on the right track. And Paul, the father of Jerry, respected this. He was a good guy, helping out his son, mentoring him. Hopefully Jerry will get off the streets one day. So being that he got his respect, Robert one day agreed to drive Jerry out of town to a dance competition. But after leaving for this competition, no one saw Jerry since. And the last person who saw Jerry was Robert. And when Robert spoke to the police, Robert explained that he had dropped Jerry off at a friend's house before they even got to the competition. And that was the last time he saw him. But that was a lie. What really happened was Robert picked up Jerry and started feeding him alcohol and drugs until he lost consciousness. And Jerry never made it to that dance competition. Instead, he was unwillingly taken to Robert's house, the house of horrors, and he gave Jerry even more drugs, injecting him with a tranquilizer, which made him completely unconscious. Now, what he does next is so incredibly disturbing. So extra warning here if you'd like to fast forward a few seconds. He continued to do this, injecting him with more drugs over a period of 28 hours while he was gagged and restrained to a bed. He tortured, sodomized, and violated him with different things. And it's like he was doing these things as a weird kind of experiment because he kept a log of everything that he did, that he gave him, and how Jerry would react to certain things. And when Jerry would gain consciousness back, he wasn't able to move his body. He pleaded to be let go and questioned why was he being treated this way? But in Robert's sick mind, he was enjoying this feeling of 
torturing this young man. And he would silence him by giving him more drugs and sedate him. But he did this over a 28-hour period, just totally disgusting and evil. Now, eventually, Jerry's body just gave up. He choked to death in Robert's home, supposedly on the drugs that he was giving him. He threw up and also he was gagged. So maybe it was a combination between the two. But regardless, he was tortured to death. And this was only the beginning. This was Robert's first victim, supposedly. Human victim. True. Now, Robert, he had this dead guy in his house and he had to get rid of the body. So he dragged Jerry's body down into the basement hung him upside down. And while he was doing all these things, he was taking pictures with his Polaroid camera. So he took a picture of this. And he made cuts, allowing the blood to drain out of the body into a cooking pot. And once the body was dry, the following day, he dismembered the body into pieces using a chainsaw and various knives and wrapped his remains in newspaper, putting them into a garbage bag and placing that bag into a bigger garbage bag and he placed it in his trash can that was taken the next day. And while the garbage was being taken, he was watching out his window to make sure that the bag wouldn't rip or that there weren't any suspicions surrounding this weird, heavy garbage bag that was in the garbage can. And the green light went on. Everything went smoothly for him. He said those houses were so close, like no one heard the chainsaw or like any of the noises that were coming from his basement. That's a really good question. He was actually worried about this, and he was also worried if the neighbors would hear his victims scream, so that's why he kept silencing them with tranquilizers Mm. and different sedatives. So this was basically confirmation that he can continue with this same evil plan and continue to never get caught. It's definitely an ego boost for him getting away with it. Now, these sick acts went on for three years, victim after victim that he called play toys. He didn't see these young men that he would bring into his home as people, but more as an object or a toy. I find it so odd that a serial killer like this goes under the radar for so long and we are fooled by how normal they are and how harmless they are. But I mean, three long years of him doing these things. Yeah, it'd be hard to keep up that disguise, I'd think. Yeah, for sure. So Jerry's dad knew that Robert took him to that dance competition or whatever. So he was the last person to see him. Was he ever suspicious that his son was now missing? Oh, yeah. He had his suspicions. He knew that Robert had met up with these younger sex workers. And Paul told the police that. Paul kept pushing for the police to check in on this Robert guy because he was the last person to see his son and just didn't seem right. It just didn't seem right. Yeah. But the police were not convinced. They made the assumption that he had run away. Plus, we all know that sex workers back in the 80s weren't really given much protection by the police. But Paul kept insisting that the police speak with Robert and bring him in for questioning. So they eventually did. And the police bringing him in for questioning wasn't because they had suspicion. It was only because Paul kept nagging them to bring him in. So basically, they already made up their minds at this point. They were just checking a box. Yeah, they were checking a box on a paper. They weren't going to put a magnifying glass up to him or kind of, you know, see if maybe he would slip up with something. We did our due diligence. He's good. Exactly. They didn't go out and do a full interrogation. So in reality... They have this guy who definitely did it, who caused Jerry's disappearance. The one who endlessly tortured him, raped him, cut him up, threw him out in the trash. But they waved Robert on and the case was put on hold on a shelf as a missing person's case. To me, this is irritating because Paul, the father, he knows his son and he knew Robert way more than the police. So if he had this suspicion... Why wouldn't they look into that a little bit more, you know? Yeah. I mean, I think it's the times. It it has to do with the fact that he was a sex worker. And, you know, just swept it under the rug. And if they would have looked into him further, 
there wouldn't be more deaths. Like there wouldn't be these like five other people who same thing happened to him. Yeah. I mean, this gave him the green light. Like he was like, oh, I can do this again. And that's exactly what happened. Robert saw this as an opportunity. He knew that the police weren't going to be looking at him and they weren't going to be looking for these missing sex workers in the area. So Robert, at this time, he had notes of hours of torture that he inflicted on Jerry and Polaroid pictures to relive the darkness of his desires. But soon those things wouldn't suffice and he would be on the hunt for his next victim. So Robert, he would put on this facade, you know, the caring father figure, giving anyone who talked to him or saw him in public the feeling of safety and security that would, without a doubt, allow his victim to be in a fully vulnerable state where going in for attack would be effortless, really. His new victim was Robert Sheldon. We will call him by his last name to sort out the confusion. And Sheldon, at the time, saw Robert as a helpful guy. He actually stayed with him on previous occasions and had no problems. Robert called him up one day, inviting him over to chillax. Maybe having a drink, smoking a little. It seemed like a nice gesture. There were a number of times that Sheldon would just show up at his doorstep, asking for a place to stay to crash for the night. And Robert seemed like the type of guy who always left his door open, so to speak. And so Sheldon was happy to come over. They took it easy for two days, Robert making sure Sheldon felt at home. They both drank, did some drugs. And Robert said, relax, I just want to take some pictures. Pretty much. But by the third day, Robert felt ready to initiate his attack. He mixed up a heavy amount of sedatives in a syringe and offered it to him. And the young 18-year-old Robert Sheldon accepted I mean, he had no reason not to trust him. But why did he wait so long to actually attack him? Well, according to Robert, during his testimony, he wasn't actually attracted to him. But he took his anger out on Sheldon. And he even took things a step further by putting little needles under his fingertips to keep him from moving or trying to leave. And wanted to do more sadistic things. So he decided to blind him with drain cleaner. Oh my... And he did this while he was awake. But Robert, he was worried that a neighbor would hear someone screaming in agony. So he sedated him again. And the torture and sexual assault continued for three days. Three days. Wow. And some sources say that he also used caulk. The stuff that you would seal a tub or a window with. And he filled his ears with it. And what adds to this is he took notes on everything that he did every reaction that Sheldon had when he would do something like put needles in his fingertips. Like he was some kind of test subject. It was like one giant experiment. Yeah, and he would take pictures with his Polaroid camera like some little sick... Like Jeffrey Dahmer. Yeah, this was pretty close to that. Now, five days after Sheldon was taken captive, Robert was alerted to a handyman who was doing some work around the house, on the outside of his house. Now, Robert, he had two options. He could either sedate Sheldon and, you know, he can go to sleep and continue with his nasty, torturous acts. But he actually decided to do the second option. He decided to eliminate him entirely. He suffocated him by tying a plastic bag over his head. And this could have been a chance for Sheldon to get free. But Robert was sure for that to not happen. And he did this while the handyman was at Robert's house, and he didn't suspect a thing. Once this handyman left the house, Robert drained his blood in the same way that he did to his first victim. Then he dismembered him, packaged up his body parts and newspapers, and got rid of any evidence in the trash. So he literally used the same method as the first killing. Yeah, because it worked. It's his blueprint at this point. In a sick desire to keep something of Sheldon's as a trophy, he kept Sheldon's head and he buried it in the backyard. He continued to do these torturous things to all of his victims, reportedly six young men in total. But it is possible that there were more. And he injected different things like bleach and drain cleaner into different parts of their bodies 
such as the throat, in an attempt to quiet their screams, and in their eyes just to see their reaction, and he would write these things down in his stupid notes. He even shocked his victims for extended periods of time with high voltage and would rape them violently to the point where they would require immediate medical attention. According to Robert's notes, another victim, Walter James Ferris, had experienced the same things as the other victims. And according to Robert's disturbing notes, 7,700 volts of electricity was used to shock him on different parts of his body, including his genitals. And he did this for two days before he died from the ongoing abuse. And also in his notes, he would do this electric shock with this much voltage on their eyes. What these young men had to go through at the hands of this sadistic monster was absolute torture to the point where they would die. Now, there was one victim, Larry Pearson, who was 20 years old, and for some reason, he was held the longest compared to the other victims. So what made him different that he kept them longer? Well, he would later tell police that Larry Pearson was the most cooperative. But I mean, what else can you do when you're being constantly drugged, you're tied down, and you can't move? Right. Now, because he was cooperative, he let him go upstairs in the bedroom from the basement where he normally kept him. And he continued to do these horrible things. This was all due to his good behavior. But that was about the extent of Robert's nice gestures. He had broken both of his hands so that he couldn't attempt to escape, as he did to some of his other victims, while being violently raped three to four times per day. So he was sexually abused and tortured the longest period of time compared to any of his victims, a total of six weeks. He actually bailed Larry out of jail and offered him a place to stay. And once he got him trapped inside his house, for six long weeks, he endured Robert's abuse, just like he had done with his other victims. It's believed that Larry was trying to play the game, which to Robert was noted as cooperative. In his only attempt to fight back, while Larry was forced to go down on Robert, he bit down so deeply and so hard in an attempt to bite it off. His penis? Yes. Whoa. And this is the first time that any victim got to seek revenge on Robert, which is like a celebration moment. Yeah, for sure. So Robert left Larry tied down in this house with ropes, and he went to the hospital. Imagine explaining that to the doctor. Now, once he got patched up, he came back to the house, and he murdered Larry. Now, Larry would be his last and final victim, because the last young man he had captured would fortunately escape putting an end to Robert's disgusting and vulgar evil obsession. It was around Easter, April of 1988, when a man desperately jumped out of Robert's second story window with nothing on but a dog collar, making an escape from the house of horrors. This young man named Christopher Bryson was captured in March of 1988. In an interview, Christopher explains that he wasn't really a sex worker, but more of a drug addict. So in exchange for sexual acts with Robert, he was hoping to get his hands on some drugs. Robert didn't look like a threat, but he didn't know him. But at the same time, he felt safe around him. Now, Robert, he tried to appear casual by giving him a beer to drink in the car as they drove toward Robert Berdella's torture house. And when they arrived at Robert's house, he greets Christopher in and guides him upstairs to his bedroom. And while Christopher is at the top of the stairs, Robert hits him in the back of the head with a heavy metal object, knocking him out. And he continued to torture him while keeping him restrained for three days. Now, Christopher reasoned that being on Robert's good side and becoming more of a friend to him would be a good idea. Robert kept his victims tied with rope at all times, mostly having their arms above their head. But Robert had let his guard down as Christopher persuaded him to let his hands be tied in front of him. And Robert agreed because they built this trust between them. Christopher was still bound, but he knew he had to get out because Robert admitted that he had murdered others. It was only a matter of time before he was murdered. Christopher found a small pack of matches in Robert's bedroom, and he hid them beneath the bed. 
When Robert left the room, Christopher was able to light a match to burn the rope. And the quickest way out was the two-story high bedroom window. So he jumped, escaping the hours of torture and soon murder, and a nearby neighbor called 911. Now imagine a man in desperate need for help who is naked, wearing only a dog collar, jumping out of your neighbor's window. Could you imagine how surprised the neighbors would be, like knowing that they were living next to this? Yeah, like you would have so many questions. What on earth is going on? And then to find out later what has been going on inside this house for, what, three years? Yeah. The feeling that Christopher probably had, knowing that he was free out of that house, was probably the best feeling in the world at the time. Yeah, I mean, he saved his own life. He prevented so many other victims from being killed because, you know, Robert would just keep on going to the next victim. Yeah. And also for Christopher, this had to have been such a scary moment because Robert could have heard the window opening or he could have smelled something burning and ran upstairs if it was taking him a long time. Christopher did this at the right time and got out of there in time before he could get caught by this killer. So was Christopher hurt at all? Or like, did he hit the ground and take off running? Like, What happened next? Well, he actually had cuts and marks all over his body indicating that he was being tortured or something was happening. Abuse was happening. And he was naked with a dog collar on, and he ran up to this neighbor. And the neighbor thought immediately something wasn't right. Christopher was then taken to the hospital. And there, within an hour, the police had obtained a search warrant. And they started to search his house. And at this point, they didn't really have anything on Robert. I mean, they had Christopher's accusations and proof based on the marks on his body. But there weren't any bodies in the house. There was nothing immediately alarming, indicating that he had been doing these things for quite some time, murdering people and torturing people. But the police were on the lookout for any proof of evidence. And going through Robert's belongings took some time. The police described the search for his belongings as a maze. He kept everything in totes and notebooks. And it took a larger team to go into the house and dig through everything so that they could investigate everything. And then they discovered the notebook where he kept his notes on torturing his victims. Oh, that journal. Now, you would think that this would be enough evidence because, as previously stated, he wrote everything down. But he would later tell police that he was actually writing some disturbing fiction book. And along with finding these strange, dark notes, he had other notebooks around the house. His store with the collections were strange, and he owned strange books. Perhaps he was just an odd bird. Now, when the media obtained this information, they ran with it, writing articles in which Robert was portrayed as a satanic occultist who sold body parts at his flea market stall. The media was going crazy over this, and Robert was becoming irritated, not defensively, as if he were innocent. He simply desired that everyone know the truth. It all came down to Robert wanting control over his own story. Because for years, he had complete control over his victims. Now, he refuses to speak to the media, but drives all the details to the police and does the same in court. I bet you everybody wanted to go to his store now. But at the same time, I feel like police would have blocked it off. Well, I mean, he probably wasn't there to run it either, so. Mm, No. (laughs) Just when you thought they couldn't find any evidence to bring this guy down, police discover a collection of Polaroid pictures, which provided all of the evidence they needed. These disturbing images showed his tortured victims in various stages, and police suspected that some of the images showed dead bodies. Now, if you remember Robert's first victim, Jerry Howell, and how his father was adamant that the police would look into Robert, Well, police show Paul images of these Polaroids to see if he was able to identify his son as one of the victims. And he was able to point out one of the Polaroids of a body hanging upside down as his son, Jerry Howell. Wow. It's crazy because if police would have just took Paul serious, they could have avoided all of these other deaths. I mean, it's like a woulda, coulda, shoulda type situation, but like potentially it all could have stopped there. 
I bet Paul was super pissed about this. Oh, yeah. He was furious, I bet. Now, Robert had taken over 200 Polaroid pictures. And in these photographs were 20 different men in different stages of torture. Now, going back to this Dahmer comparison that we kept doing, these Polaroids. Very similar, isn't it? And didn't they use those in the, the Dahmer case, too, like in the trial? Yeah. It's crazy. It's like the same type of person. Yeah. It's like they kind of grew up with the same kind of childhood, like the animal abuse thing. Mm -hmm. So there's definitely patterns in here. Yeah. Now, the police, they discovered remains of one of his victims buried in his backyard around this time. And using dental records, they were able to confirm the remains belonging to Robert Sheldon. Now, Robert eventually agreed to a plea bargain to avoid the death penalty. Until 1992, he was held at the Moorside State Penitentiary. Then, on October 8, 1992, Robert complained to prison staff that he was having heart pains. So the prison staff sent him to the hospital. But Robert died in transit from a heart attack, not even two hours after he first complained of his heart. So I guess bad hearts ran in the family because, what, his dad died of the same thing. Yeah, and I think we said he died at, what, like age 39 or something? Yeah, both were really young. And Robert, he was 43 when he passed away. And he only spent four years in prison. So this is something I've always wondered. Like, what happens with these criminals, like these serial killers, these mass murderers, evil people? Like, do they have funerals or are they just like cremated and flushed down the toilet? Like, (laughs) (laughs) For the most part, it seems like they're just cremated, but it depends on what the family wants. Yeah, if anyone cared about them. Right. But for the most part, they're cremated. Something weird happened with Dahmer's body, though, right? With something with the parents. What was that? Yeah, so the mom and the dad of Jeffrey Dahmer were actually, like, fighting over his remains. Ah, oh, yeah. Because he was cremated, and so they split them in half. Like, you get half, I get half? Yeah. You know what's weird is I just saw that Jeffrey Dahmer's dad died. I did, too. In the yeah. news, like, today. Yeah. That's so weird. You want to know another interesting thing about this case that I discovered that is so annoying it's interesting but it's like irritating can i say no no you're not allowed oh so after all this is said and done robert died no more crimes robert had all of this evidence at his house like a chainsaw different things there were ashes at his house that were in his fireplace that were believed you know to have been remains from people Mm -hmm. these things are on a website currently and they're being sold auctioned off so the the camera that he used like the polaroid camera is yeah. selling for fifteen thousand dollars this guy has like fans i never heard of this dude yeah so like this guy started a website he actually obtained all of these things from the lawyers because mm-hmm. they had all of this evidence the lawyers did yeah and he's like some millionaire guy and he put these all on a website but he died so now it's like in his family's hands i think this kind of ties into what we talked about in, like, the the Bever case that we did last week. It's like this dude is, like, a hometown hero. Like, people are buying his murder weapons and, and things. Yeah, it's- and I even seen a YouTube video, like, not to, like, point out any content creators, but it made me literally gag. So this YouTuber, he shows, like, he bought, like, swabs. He took them out of the paper, and they were swabs used, you know, forensic, like... the From friend- Robert. Yeah. And when he took him out, he's like, oh, my God, those smell so bad. And he, like, put him back. And it's like, this is just wrong. Like, how is this even allowed? Yeah. It's just so heinous and disrespectful to all the families and the victims. Because these victims went through so much pain. Like, wow. I mean, these were all young men, too. Like, 19, 20, 21 who were on the streets, who were just trying to do the best that they could. Right. You know, like they had, had so much life to live. Like, it was all stolen from them. And that's the story of the Kansas City Butcher, which is disgusting and probably ruined everyone's day. Yeah. Didn't you have a nightmare over this? I actually did. I had a couple nightmares. I don't think I'll ever write another story like this again. Now, I know that I need to leave on a good note because ugh, I feel like I need to go to church after this episode. I saw you looking at churches earlier today. (laughs) 
But let's leave it on a good note. I found a little story that happened in the news. Allegedly, there is a serial wedding crasher who was arrested at a wedding. She is 57 years old, and she is accused of stealing money and wedding cards. So she's in it for the money. Like, I assume she was, like, just trying, trying to, to have a good time. Yeah. <laughs> trying meet, to meet people. Meet a man. <laughs> No, she was she was one of those ladies that would like, you know, hang out by the card box drinking some champagne. Wow. I thought she was like Will Farrell and Wedding Crashers. You know what's so weird about that? Like anytime I've been to a wedding, I always feel so uncomfortable being close to the card box. Like I feel like it's the area you don't go unless you're like dropping the card off. <laughs> like, oh, you're, like, like where you drop off the, the money? Yeah. Or the card yeah. with money. But somehow this lady got away with it and she crashed weddings in three different states. And she just so happened to be arrested at a wedding in Mississippi on September 30th, 2023. Arrested? Did she try the uh, Uncle Ned's kids? <laughs> I'm Uncle Ned's kid. So I don't know where she is now, but supposedly the uh, police arrested her. Her name is Sandra Lynn Henson, and she ruined people's weddings. And they're probably looking in their card box and going, what the heck? Where's all my wedding money? Do you think she made it into, like, the wedding video or some of the pictures? Oh, my gosh. That's crazy. Yeah. I love it. You know what's funny is I used to be a wedding photographer, and I would be taking pictures of people. They give you a list, too, don't you? Some people did. They're like, definitely, I don't want any pictures of her, okay? And I'm like, okay. Yeah. (laughs) I remember that. Well, this was a rough episode. Yeah. Pretty rough. It was interesting, but... Definitely the bad part of the salad. You know, like the rotten part where you're like, ooh, I should have threw this bag of salad out a day ago. You didn't have enough ranch dressing, so now you're just eating soggy leaves. Yeah, that kind. Until next time. Until next time.